Welcome again to the Strange Brew Podcast. My name's Jason Barnard. That was Tony Banks, and after the lie, from his debut solo album, A Curious Feeling. It's from a new cherry red esoteric 
box set, the Tony Banks, Banks Vaults, a collection of his solo albums from 1979 to 1995. Many of you will know Tony from his work as a founder member of Genesis. And through this podcast show with him, we do get a chance to hear how his solo material and Genesis kind of weave together and how they interchange. So let's hear my chat with Tony. Hi, Tony. Uh, good to talk to you. It's uh, it's uh, Jason. Jason here. It's Tony here, yeah. What's new about this release? I understand it's been remastered. Yeah, we've remastered. And obviously some of the tracks are also were remixed, which I did. Some of the ones that I did for the uh, compilation album I did a couple of years ago um, are called Too Far. So... You know, it's a bit different, and certainly the remastering is is good. It's always worth worth doing that because techniques are much better now than they used to be. And some of these albums are sort of 20, 20, 25, 30 years old, probably not older, mm. actually. 40 years, I don't know, very old. Mm. <laughs> so um, they need a bit of help. And for the first time, it's got a bonus DVD of uh, promotional videos, which I don't think have, have been seen. No, although I have to say that, I mean, you know, these days, I suppose... The videos are all available kind of, you know, YouTube-wise, mm. aren't they? You can always find them. But no, it's nice to have them all there. I mean, you know, there are a couple of good ones in there. They're not all, I mean, not quite mm. so sure about the one where I'm, I'm singing myself. But the other ones, you know, are quite fun, I think, particularly some of the later ones. Mm. A great opportunity to shine a light on your solo career and, uh, you know, material that really deserves kind of much of a wider, wider airing these days. Well, I'm, you know, I'm very pleased you say that, but well, I mean, yes, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a weird thing because the albums actually sort of did, did worse in the order they were released. I mean, the Curious Feeling did okay. And then mm. the later ones sort of did nothing. And by the time you got to Strictly Inc., I mean, I doubt it made sort of a hundred copies, you know, it was mm. kind of, it was very difficult to get any interest at that particular point in time. While the group obviously was getting more and more popular. It's just one of those things, really. I think I never had a, a song, a single or something that kind of made me sort of, uh, stand out enough from the crowd in a way um, and I think the records the music on them mm. is what it is I mean it's, it's 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 as good as what I wrote for, for Genesis at the same time and sometimes the Genesis some of those songs obviously have become kind of very well known mm. and classics in a way so it would be nice if things had gone a bit better but it was you know I mean looking back on it I'm very pleased to have done them I loved making the records at the time and I was always pleased with them mm. and I still am and I can listen to them again and most of it I'm happy with you know and I think it's I think I did a, did a good job yeah and uh, in the build-up to, to that period with you know a few years before a curious feeling you were writing uh, seemingly quite uh, prolifically and you know many people describe a, a trick of the tale as kind of a, a lost Tony Banks album given you know you were involved with all the tracks there well, yes, that's a little, a little unfair on the others, I think. But there were, you know, three or four tracks I wrote pretty much on my own on that. And then the others I con- contributed to, I suppose. And, and, you know, sometimes significant bits. I mean, you know, I, uh, well, obviously, Steve had just done his solo album. So he was very dry of ideas. And I think, you know, we were, Peter had gone. And so I had a lot of material. I had actually considered even doing a solo album at that point, really. And then I thought, well, I won't, you know, I won't got some well, you know genesis we've got to keep we're going to keep it going we need all the stuff we can get and i had a pretty good period of time and also things like sort of madman moon and mm. robbery Souls and battery and stuff i'd sort of been working on and and it kind of uh so they just came to the we just when the group was there we decided to do them i mean i had a you know my writing from sort of this period 70 the, the late 70s mm. i was writing a lot of stuff and um you know very it sort of came to me quite easily and i, I enjoyed doing enjoyed it and i think I wrote sort of some of my best stuff at during a link with and then there were three in that there's a a track called Undertow that kind of has got a tie with a curious feeling and and that Genesis album. Well yes, well Undertow originally I had a you know an introduction to Undertow that you know included some of the elements that ended up in the from the Undertow. Mm. I think I'd got a quite a long introduction to um Burning Rope and stuff and I think the the other two felt that I'd sort of you know, mm. I was kind of outstaying my welcome a little bit so we decided to get rid of the introduction to undertow which didn't worry me too much mm. and then when we were asked to do mike and i were asked to, to write the music to a film called the shout um i had this piece and i there was a sort of section in it uh it was kind of which was a sort of slightly spooky chords which i thought could really suit the film well so i kind of took the introduction i'd written for undertow and sort of turned it around and made what was just a link bit into the main bit and used the sort of the main bit as just a link. Mm. And, uh, and it came, and I, was, I liked the way it turned out. So in the film, um, The Shout, it wasn't used very sort of um, mm. prominently. I mean, it worked nicely in the film, but it wasn't prominent 
as all that. So I thought this is a good piece of music. I'd like to use it as a starting point for this sort of, you know, solo album, which was something I'd had planned for a while. And, and that's how it turned out. You were writing in, in the run-up to a, a Curious Thing quite a, a lot with a drum machine, you know, something that you'd successfully done with tracks like Duchess, which was from Duke. Yes, well, we had a, the, the drum machines. All three of us got a drum machine originally, which were from Roland, the sort of first ones off the press, actually, of this particular new new machine they'd got. And I used it at home, really, to, to write with. Um, it never occurred to me to actually use the sounds mm. on the record, and I do regret that because, obviously, when Phil did his album and as the drummer he wasn't really very excited by the drum machine originally but obviously it then he used ended up using it quite extensively in the in the background on on the album face value you know so for all his demos and everything and when we were doing duke he, he you know he fiddled around with it while we were doing the song duchess and we really liked the effect i think duchess is probably one of the first um, was certainly the first thing by any of us that ended up using the drum machine with such prominence, you know, mm. and it had such a wonderful character about it. And I think what it, we found was that both as when I was writing Curious Feeling and obviously when we were writing as Genesis, the drum machine kind of freed you up a little bit to do other things, particularly when we were a three-piece, because um, it meant that Phil could sort of sing rather than having to drum, which was quite an interesting thing. And so, you know, that, that did help a bit as well. And I must must mention uh, Kim Beacon, who's the, the you know the, the singer on A Curious Feeling, and his voice yeah. really shines through on on uh, songs like Lucky Me. Yeah, I think he had a lot. I, I really liked his voice, and I sort of chose him from tapes. I didn't realise actually he was he was anything to do with charisma at the time, and obviously he was singing with string driven thing and stuff at the time. But mm. he was he just had a, a really good, quite versatile voice. He was a sort of it's a curious thing because obviously he's no longer with us, you know, and everything. So I kind of almost. I mean, I made the record with him, got close to him during the record, and I never saw him afterwards. So he's sort of become the character in, in, as portrayed in, in, the, in the story of, of the album, you know, mm. which is kind of a strange thing, really. So he's sort of 
becomes a slightly sort of lonely lost figure, <laughs> which is probably not fair at all. But I don't, you know, I know no difference. So that's kind of how I see him. And I, it, I thought his voice really suited the record. He was, it was my first sort of experience of working with someone other than Phil or Peter. And he was, you know, he was very, he was very easy to work with. My name is unimportant and my job you could call me But I like to work and I do it well That's enough for me I think there was a time when I could do and did much more I have dreams in which I kept in the ship And hear the ocean roar I've lived alone for all I can remember That only means some six or seven years And I would rather be nobody else I'm happy as I am All I need is in my way your next album the fugitive you actually took the leap to sing on the material yourself yeah songs like this is love and i've, I've heard that you've you kept the lyrics intentionally simple yeah. to make that easier for you well there's the lyrics that is more than more the melody lines actually ah. in many ways to keep them simple and then the lyrics yes i mean you know they keep the whole thing quite direct i i i mean i first started it and i was sort of singing along i mean i'd done 
a demo version of um, of the song uh, uh, Keep It Dark, mm. where I'd sung to the others, and I, I'd, I'd done the demo, so they heard it, and and they said, well, that sounds all right, it's not bad, you know, <laughs> so it kind of gave me a bit of encouragement, really, and I sort of had this kind of way of singing that, you know, my voice is basically quite pure, and if I mm. sing normally, it's a bit choir boyish, but a bit like... Um, sort of, uh, you know, Al Stewart or something like that kind of voice, mm. you know. And I just, I wanted to find a bit more aggression to it. So I, I found this sort of way of singing, uh, which required a slightly simpler melody and a simpler, more direct kind of lyric seemed to help that. I, I wanted to sing on this record, really, because there'd been a sort of identity problem on A Curious Feeling, mm. was, you know, who, some people sort of suggested I was the singer, and I obviously wasn't. And it got a bit confusing. So I thought, well, I'll try singing myself and see how it works out. And, uh, you know, it was fun to do. It taught me a lot about songwriting and everything, and, and I was pretty pleased with the result, so it was, it was good to do.
you did quite a number of soundtracks in in the 1980s and uh, I think the uh, orchestral version you know of the main theme of Wicked Lady works really well and acts as a bridge in terms of your you know your current uh, classical work well it was in a way I mean I'd kind of written this you know when Michael Winner said you you know asked me to do the film and I said well I'll go and I gave him played him uh, this theme you know on the piano and he said that's really lovely and things and but he wanted an orchestral score so and I obviously had no sort of at that stage never worked with an orchestra um, I kind of, uh, he suggested this guy, Christopher Palmer, who was an experienced arranger, uh, music song, you know, uh, film writer himself. And, um, and he, he made this theme much better than it was when I played it, I think, really. And what was interesting about it was that the main version of the theme um, on the record is just the same piece of music played about nine times. But it, it is always different, and it doesn't get boring. And I find that as a writer, I'm always I'm not very good at that. I'm not very good at repeating things. I like to sort of do them a couple of times and go somewhere else, you know. Mm. So it's quite interesting having someone else saying, "Well, no, this is really nice. We should make it work." And he just all these different arrangements he did of it, just in that sort of period of about three or four minutes, I think worked really well. So it, it made me very interested in the possibility of doing, um, you know, the orchestral music, which obviously I've come to do later, because it just was mm. something I felt that what had been a fairly simple theme ended up sounding a lot better with the orchestra and everything, and it was, it was a good experience.
of your own bank statement. Mm. You worked with uh, Steve Hillage. Yeah. Well, Steve, <laughs> Steve is a, he's a one-off, actually. Um, we had good times and bad times, really. Uh, but we, in the end, we ended up, you know, it worked out really well, I think. He's, he's kind of, he has a slightly different approach to music. Mm. Um, he's, he's, he's sort of much more kind of, he tries to sort of think about how it's actually working in terms of making certain all the beats are in exactly the right place and all the rest of it, which is something I never really worried about too much. But anyhow, that sort of, that kind of, you know, it produced a good result, I think. The only problem I had with that album was that he was down to be the guitarist. Mm. But he was sort of going through a period when he didn't really like to play guitar. <laughs> so <laughs> I got him to play on a couple of tracks, you know, and the little bits he did were very nice. But the guitar, the guitar is slightly absent on that record, I think. Um, you know, if I'd known he was going to be that, uh, you know, not, not to play that little, I would probably have got someone else in to, to help me out a bit. You can hear him a little bit on uh, Queen of Darkness, though, I think. Yeah, he played a little bit, got quite good towards the end, I think. And he sort of, sort of slightly lost himself and he actually started just sort of jamming along and it was quite good. And little, little nice little bits in the song Rain Cloud, I think he played some little bits which are quite, quite nice. But in, you know, a lot of the tracks which could have done with a, a bit more of the old beef from a guitar, mm. um, didn't, didn't really get them. So it was kind of, that was a slight disappointment for me. But, you know, I th- I'm, I'm pleased with the album. And, and to be honest, uh, Virgin Records, who were, you know, obviously responsible for, you know, the, the, my record company at that time, they loved the album. And, they wanted, they thought it would do a lot. Of course, it didn't, unfortunately. But it was an attempt to get away from being just sort of a Tony Banks solo album to try and make it sort of look a bit more like a group. Mm. And um, you know, had good singers, Alistair Gordon and Janie Climack and everything. And it was just a nice, you know, nice little combination. Good drama, Jeff Dugmore. It was, mm. it was, a, it was a fun, fun thing to do. Thank you. 
And you worked with a range of uh, vocalists on your next album uh, still, uh, you know, especially uh, people like Nick Kershaw and, you know, with a very commercial track such as um, I Want to Change the Score. Mm. Well, I thought that would, I mean, I really thought that was going to be a hit, I have to say. Mm. It was kind of could have been a hit, I think, and then listening to it in the period, even now I listen back to it, and it fits very much in the period of time and everything. Um, the only problem I had with that a little bit was that, that Nick, you know, who was, was great to work with, we had a really good time. But he he didn't want to promote it. He he sort of had gone gone a bit sort of camera shy at that point, and didn't want to want to do it. So we had a few opportunities to to play that on TV and stuff, and we had to turn them down. So mm. we had did a video, obviously, but it kind of um, you know didn't get enough plays. So it never never quite took off, unfortunately. But I mean, I think it was nice working. I felt that having um, you know since it hadn't worked with me singing and hadn't worked with having you know a, a group, I thought I just well I'm just going to go for singers courses for courses type attitude and use different singers on different tracks and you know the opportunity of working with well nick was someone i'd i really loved his his fourth album called the works which is an album that didn't do very well mm. actually but it had a, a particular track on it called cowboys and indians that um he, i thought was a fantastic track and i've had also wonderful drumming from vinnie Coluta. so i kind of hired them both for the next my next solo album as it were and vinnie played on most of the album and obviously Nick sang on three or four songs, and it was great. And then of course I had Fish, obviously on that someone yeah. who, you know, it was obviously in the same kind of zone as I was, and that was entertaining as well because he's sort of, although he ends up sounding a little bit like Peter Gabriel, he doesn't. He's a very different kind of personality, and uh, yeah, we had a lot of entertainment doing those, and, and every it was a good album, I think. You know, I, I look back on it and I think, well, you know, it's one that got away a bit, right. really, because I think it's had had a chance. <laughs> I'm 
your final album in this set, Strictly Inc. Tracks like Charity Ball, some really interesting lyrics. Yeah, well, I mean, I kind of... Yeah, you know, well, Charity Balls, of course, is actually quite, uh, you know, relevant, in fact. Would have, could have been written about Jimmy Savile and quite a few other people as well, really. Mm. Um, when I wrote it, I was right thinking more about a kind of general... Uh, there was a bit of kind of uh, dodgy stuff going on in the Commons, I think, about sort of people being bribed and you weren't quite sure what was going on. And yet, you know, all these people kind of um, mm. have... You know, they must always be frightened of being found out. I mean, Jimmy Savile must have been frightened. I'm not frightened, mm. but he must have known that he was mm. possibly going to be found out. In fact, he wasn't found out until after he died, which was an extraordinary thing for him, really. But it's it's the fact that people have, a lot of people in the public eye have a lot to hide. I'm sure Mr. Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Johnson, our future prime minister, presumably, um, has quite a lot to hide. But there you go. It's sort of, it, that, that, that was the idea of the song, and it was done tongue-in-cheek. And I, I think it was... Uh, I would quite like to have made a bit more of that song in a way. Could have done a good video. I quite fancied having the chorus done with kind of pressmen, you know, dressed as pigs or something. I don't know. I had an idea in my brain how it could work. But <laughs> anyhow, we never got around to doing that because we never got a chance to put it out as a single. But it was a, a good thing.
But I mean, I think in terms of the album in general, I wanted to go back to trying to work with one person. I really like Jack Hughes's voice. He was very sort of similar. His taste in music was not that far from mine, and he's a sort of intelligent chap, and we had a lot of fun working on it. And I wanted to do one, just let myself go a little bit on one track on this record. So I had the song Island in the Darkness, which is, you know, obviously a 15-minute piece, which I think echoes sort of some of the early Genesis stuff and everything a bit. Um, you know, like I had a, a theme that I thought could really work well as a big guitar solo. And I uh, got Daryl Sturmer in for doing, to do that and everything. And I think I think that was a really good track. But, you know, that particular stage in time, and as has proved to be the case for many years since, long, long form music is not really, um, gets, doesn't get much of an outlet really anymore. So, uh, you know, so the record, unfortunately, the whole Strictly Ink, unfortunately, just didn't do anything. I, I couldn't even get a sort of, you know, I mean, I said, it's probably, if it's sold 100 copies, I'd be surprised, you know. So what's really nice about this set is to be able to put all those things out there again and give them another little chance to sort of, they're not, I'm not going to, I'm not expecting big sales or anything, but it's just nice so that people who have liked what I've done with Genesis have the chance to hear these things and, and see what I was up to while everyone else was spending time at the top of the charts, you know.
And then just to close, and I know we've kind of talked quite a bit about your solo work. Is there any tracks that are from the Genesis canon you were written that that you feel are underappreciated and want want to kind of shine a light on as well? What was in the Genesis thing? Well, yeah. Oh, it's a difficult thing, really, because the Genesis stuff always gets quite a lot of attention just because it's on the Genesis album. I mean, you know, and get certain songs that's you know, that like the Afterglows and everything, which kind of have become very big mm. sort of stage songs and everything. So they get a lot of attention. I mean, it's I don't really know. I mean, it's, you have a song like Many Too Many, I suppose, would be a song that I felt perhaps had a, we did release it as a single. And um, I think it had a chance to do a bit better. But it was yeah. it was we'd had a big hit with... Uh, follow you follow me and then i think also the trouble was with genesis the reason why we often didn't score very well in charts was just really because people used to go out and buy the hmm. record the album you know they'd hear a single and they say well that's nice but they'll go out and buy the album there's no point in buying a single so yes. it's you know whereas i think a lot of people who are more singles acts tend to sell singles you know and then the album might sell on the back of that but with us you know, when we put out thing, all these things, they just sort of hmm. people tended to wait for the album and obviously if we put out a second single most people who, who has already got it. So it's kind of like, it didn't really work for us that, you know, in a way. I mean, if you think about the sort of current climate where everything's done on sort of like, um, you know, uh, Spotify and all the rest of it and streaming, we probably would have done all right, really, because, you know, these tracks would have been streamed, I suppose, <laughs> in a way, because it wasn't quite the same commitment to have to go out and buy the things. You know, I don't know. I, who knows? I mean, I'm not, we had such a fantastic time as Genesis that I'm, yeah. Uh, I don't really have any problems, you know. I think most of the sort of stuff I wrote for Genesis got got reasonable attention. I mean, you know, you can always think there's one or two that got away, but in the main, they they did great. Fantastic. Well, all the best with the release of Bank yeah. Spots, and uh, it, it's great to talk to you, Tony, and uh, shine shine a light on your solo career. Well, thanks a lot for that. That's great. All right, pleasure. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye.
Thank you for listening to the Strange Brew Podcast. If you do like the show, please consider a small donation to help keep the show archive online. It's been almost 10 years since I started the podcast and hosting fees are increasing over time. All your support keeps the show running and helps me get amazing guests. To support me, just go to thestrangebrew.co.uk where you'll see a donate button on the homepage. Thank you very much. Plus, any reviews on your podcast services help to spread the word too. Thank you.